Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool with NathanCoolPhoto.com and in this episode I want to give you some tips on speeding up your interior photography. It's one of the biggest challenges that I get requests from, from a lot of people that train with me, a lot of people posting questions. How long does it take to do a shoot? How can I get through it faster? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover a variety of tips. First I'm going to go through some of the things you can do while you're on site to cut down some of the time that you're shooting and also then some things you can do in post-processing. So I'm going to cover a variety of tips in that also then next after. And then to wrap things up I'll throw in a few other real quick things as well. So so a lot of this, by the way, is covered throughout my real estate photography series, and especially this will be in the interiors book and also in my lighting guide. If you have those, you might want to refer to those. If you don't, you're not familiar with those, I have a link to all of my books down in the description for this video. It will be somewhat important to know some of these things because this builds off of the flambient technique, and you may have seen some videos that I've done with that as well. Having the full breadth of knowledge throughout the books, this will really help, especially when we get into working with lighting because that's the tough nut to crack, isn't it? When we talk about interior photography and how do you make it fast, that's the fallback reason why a lot of people then just use HDR instead of lighting, but it can go very quickly. So I've got a link to other videos, which you can watch, they don't cost you anything at all. And of course, then I've got links to those books once again. So let's cover first though the things to do on site. One of the first things that I have to stress is that if you really want to speed up your workflow while you are on site is to really really get good gear and especially what's most important of all no matter what camera you use is that you want that camera mounted to a very good tripod head and you want it mounted then to a very good tripod. The reason being is that when you have a really good tripod and a really good tripod head is that you aren't going to have shake vibrations or anything moving that from frame to frame. Also you're not going to get drift. So uh, what can happen is if you're using a bulbous type lens like the ones I recommend in the books is that you're going to get a uh, they're heavy lenses and they're going to start drifting downwards. For instance since the, the Nikon 14 to 24, like I like to use the Takina 16 to 28 f2.8. And those are heavy lenses. So if you have that on a ball head, yes, I've recommended in the past, you can start that way if you want to see what it's like. Nowadays, though, Benro has come out, as you know, with a less expensive alternative for a geared head. And I'll have a link to that in the description also so you can check that out. So that really can keep your head very stable. It also allows you, it also allows you to do some very small micro adjustments so that can keep things steady but one of the most important things is then when you move to another section of the room or to another room uh, completely you're probably not going to have to level it all that much sure you're going to have some unlevel houses and sure you're going to have carpet in one room and all of a sudden hardwood floor especially like in bedrooms and that can make it uneven but for the most part you're not going to really have to fiddle too much then with a ball head but most importantly on top of all that you're not going to get then lens drift and worry about having any misalignment. So definitely right off the bat, make sure that you're using a good tripod and a very good tripod head. The next tip for speeding things up while you're on site is I don't recommend using a cam ranger or some other remote that you're viewing on an iPad or your phone. The reason being is that when you're doing fast interior photography for just standard real estate listings, that can be a burden. So instead, as you know, I recommend using RF triggers, so some type of radio frequency trigger. Not the line of sight infrared triggers, but they're very inexpensive. Uh, I recommend nowadays using the Yang Nuos. I've got some links also to those in the description for the video. But a pair of those, very inexpensive, very small. You can put the, the one transmitter in your pocket. So basically just using a shutter release. The reason being is you don't then have a leg coming from the cam ranger. You also don't have to worry about constantly charging the cam ranger and worrying about battery power or signal issues and stuff like that. But you don't have to wait for every time you do a, a, a take, every time you shoot an image, that you have to wait for that to download. Yeah, Yes, you can go ahead and shoot in raw and JPEG so that a small JPEG comes down to the cam ranger, but it still won't be as fast as just having a wireless trigger in your hand. So I'm going to delve a little bit more into that when I get to the post processing. But basically, as you know, when I do a lot of this lighting, they're two sided composites. I've got a key light that sits uh, near the camera while I'm then doing a side to side composite. If you've ever done uh, any type of lighting, photography, portraits or whatnot, you know you have key and fill. So anyway, Anyways, um, and also a back and other stuff. 
but the key lighting staying right there by the camera and then you're walking back and forth doing these two-sided composites with your fill to fill in that other end of the room is that you can quickly just be firing off that shutter release, click, and then you turn the thumb wheel on your speed light, click, turn your thumb wheel on your speed light, click. So you're just going click, 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 click. Go to the other side of the room, click, 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 click. There's no waiting for anything to download. That speeds things up big time. Same thing goes then doing two-sided pops in the shower, so doing multiple shower pops. This allows you to keep changing flash power and not have to keep looking at the back of your camera or on a cam range or to see, okay, is my histogram right of center? Well, that's where we want it to be, but we just don't have time to keep looking at it. It's just faster just to take a bunch of clicks, a bunch of uh, flash uh, power exposures, and then just move on. Sure, go back to the camera, ensure that you did get enough footage to work with, but you don't have to keep fiddling, take a shot, look at it, take another shot, look at it, see what the power would be. So anyways, that's why I don't recommend using a cam ranger. You can be much faster on site with just some simple radio frequency inexpensive shutter releases. Another biggie is don't waste time on rooms that don't need it. You don't need to waste a lot of time on the kids' bedrooms. They're going to be a mess, <laughs> probably. They're, they're not the selling feature of the house. Kitchens and bathrooms are, and maybe the big living areas, outside stuff too. But when you're looking at the kids' rooms, yeah, just get a picture from the doorway and just call it a day. Don't worry if it's not the exact exposure or whatnot. You can correct a lot in post because you're going to be shooting in RAW. RAW is just definitely important you know, when you're shooting anyways for real estate. Of course, all the work I do, I shoot in raw. But the, the idea here is that you don't spend a lot of time. Don't, you don't have to worry about window pulls necessarily in kids' rooms. When it comes to laundry rooms, get in and out quickly. Sometimes even just a single ambient shot is enough for a laundry room. Those things are going to be at the end of the listing. So anyways, keep it simple when it comes to those rooms. So the last one, when it comes to just while you're on site, now I'm going to be getting into the post-processing stuff, got some really cool stuff there that I want to be able to show you. But when you're on site, also don't overshoot. Now you might remember a video here a little while back where I talked about making a shot list. So that is very important. You don't want to be showing up to some three bedroom, two bath house and take 45 pictures. I don't know what you'd take 45 pictures of, but believe it or not, people do all kinds of stuff. What happens is you're a photographer, you have an artistic streak. You see opportunity in front of you all the time. So when you're faced with a house, especially if it's somewhat well appointed, every idea that you could imagine starts floating through your head and you want to shoot it all. Unfortunately, that's not going to be profitable. <laughs> so if you want to speed things up, then think about sticking to that shot list. Now, on that uh, same vein, if a realtor has a very, very well appointed house and you see the opportunity to shoot more, you can ask them. It's like, hey, I see a lot of other stuff here that you might want to have. It might take me a little longer and then you can always upsell them on another package. But once again, make sure that it is worth monetarily to you that you are going to be paid for that extra time. Okay, now let's jump into some post-processing stuff that will speed things along and then I'll wrap up with a couple other quick tips before ending this video. First tip is really related to while you're on site, but it does have something to do with post-processing and easier to show you here, and that's to know your flash equivalents. I talk about this in the lighting guide. I have tables for each one of the setups where I show the difference between using a speed light to an 8200, a 400, a 600, so that you can judge how much light you will need when you get into two-sided composites, when we start doing this type of stuff. So you can see here's our ambient shot. That's fine. I was happy with it, but now I got to get my flash shots. So the first thing I do is I test the key light, so I get an exposure where I think this should be. And once you get used to flash equivalents and the lighting guide type of setups, you'll know that pretty much where you should be. But here, I know that I'd like the exposure for what's close to camera, so the foreground, but I need to get the background lit. And I can do that by now knowing if this was using a certain amount of power, how much power would I need to use then for the fill light that then goes in as I start going across. So what I'm able to do is because I'm also using just a wireless trigger, as you can see here clipped in my belt, and I'm not using a cam ranger, I can go very quickly through this. Taking what I know should be the flash equivalent to my key light, my fill light here is just going click, 
and then I up the flash power, click, up the flash power, click, go to the other side and do the same thing. It's extremely fast. Don't have to wait for anything to download from a Can Ranger. So that um, really helps quite a bit. Now, once we have that, you've got a lot of footage, you know that you can use it. Yeah, I'll do a window pull and I'm gonna get to that also here in a second. And I'm gonna show then how this would be applied. Opening all these in Photoshop, we can see now that how we would use the 50-50 Flambient to really speed things along. You may have seen other videos on this, the, and I've got a link to you know all these videos, once again, the description here of this video. But once again, here's our ambient layer. I'll just turn that off for a second, and here's my two-sided composite. This was just the other side that I painted myself in. Now, in uh, my books and through some of the videos, I showed using a brush to paint some of this in, and yes, that is your most controlled way of doing it, and it will give you the best looking shot, but for the most part, even for a luxury home like this, you'd be surprised how often a 50-50 flambient can be used. This is how it's done. Let's turn on this layer. This is the uh, layer, the ambient shot, it's in normal mode. Like normally, we would turn this into luminosity mode like we do any other flambient, but instead of putting a layer mask on it, just drop the opacity down to about 50%, and that's all you need to do. Now, that looks pretty good, so that's pretty even compared to where it was. Now, take this one step further, and remember these keystrokes. Go Escape, V, 6. And what that does, if I'm over here, Escape, V, 6, is it makes sure that I am not touching the brush, that I am touching now the layers, so escape V7, that's now changing the opacity to seven, so I can go escape V3, and then I can go five, six, seven, as long as I'm on the layer and I don't have a tool selected, it's changing the opacity up here. So anyways, that's the 50-50 Flambient, and that can get you there most of the time, no painting done. Have a little bit too much ambient, put a layer mask on, and erase some of it. So this is an option that can get you there very quickly. The next thing is when it comes to doing window pulls. So this can be a pain because as you know, I'm gonna take this window pull up to the top and I'm gonna talk a couple things about this. One is that we would turn this into a darken mode. So I'll turn that into darken mode and then like normal layer mask hide. Now, like I've said in the book before, to have the most control, you would use a brush at 100% flow and paint this in. Here's something even quicker take a polygon tool and just draw a polygon outside the window. Now, you can be very sloppy once again because this is dark in mode. So you can see I'm way over the frame. Reverse your colors by hitting X on your keyboard. You can see it changed the colors over here from black to white. Hit delete. Reverse your colors by pressing X again, press Control D to deselect it. Done, your window pull is there. So that's it, you didn't have to worry about painting it in. If you get a little bit too much shadow or weirdness going on here, like there's a little bit of shadow over here from, from the, this plant over here, if you wanna get rid of that, then you can just take eraser and then tap some of that out of there. So you have a little bit more editing flexibility this way, but it goes very quickly and most of the time you don't need to do that. The next thing when it comes though to window pulls is people will sometimes get just crazy on trying to perfect the pull. They, one thing that people don't like, and I don't like it necessarily either, are these reflections that's showing up. But sometimes reflections happen. If we take this unflashed shot, this is just an ambient shot at the exposure that I was using for the, the uh, window pull, the reflections are there. There's no getting rid of them. Sure, the windows are a little bit hazy, but some of that will come out in post-processing. Plus, we're way back here. It was better still with this window pull than without it, so I would just leave the window pull just like that. There's no need to really fuss with that anymore. The next thing is to make sure that you have actions and presets. I can't stress that enough. Yes, there are presets that you can use in Lightroom. And of course, when I'm working on a, a, a photo and I'm done with it, I have the presets that I apply to. And you can see there was one here when I edited in Photoshop, it was like this. I added a preset to get me started. You can see some of the adjustments here. And these of course are in the book. And then I did a little bit of tweaking. Boom, until I finally exported it out. So those are the presets in Lightroom, but also then when you think about actions, I have a whole list of actions of things that I use. You can see them here where I'm doing tons of stuff. So everything too that I just showed you here was done with a uh, with an action. For instance, if I were to take this back into normal mode, this uh, ambient layer, and say uh, I'm gonna have it at 100% opacity, 
I have an action that if I press it, I've got my 50-50 flambient, done. That's it. So I didn't have to go through, set it to luminosity mode, set the opacity to 50%, it's done. So make your actions to do these repetitive processes. If you find yourself repeating something from one shot to the next, make, a, make an action for it, memorize what those are. And of course, if you need to, you can always open up your action window and there's different views you can get, you know, to see which ones they are. But remember the keystrokes that you assign to them and that will really help speed that along. Another thing to keep in mind is to really speed things up is besides actions and presets is to use shortcut keys themselves. So for instance, I like to use stuff out of the menu. I don't like to uh, use the mouse any more than I have to. It's very slow. So if I wanted to add a layer mask, for instance, to this, instead of going down here, taking my mouse, dragging it down here and hitting the little icon, I just go layer mask hide. Done. If I need to invert it, control I. So whatever I did, let me go through that again before I added the, the layer mask to it, I'd go to the layer menu. I'd go hit, and I did that by doing Alt L. Then I'd hit M, which brings up layer mask. And then I'd hit either R or H, which then is either reveal all or hide all. And that would then make that. So learn how to type those, those keyboard shortcuts by using those menu hotkey items. So once again, it'd just be layer mask hide. Done, control I, invert it if I need to. So that can speed things along a lot then. Trying to use a mouse, move it over here, plus you're gonna get carpal tunnel after a while once you do a lot of editing. So that will help really speed things along. Another thing too, real quick, that I find a lot of people overlook is when uh, they're using Lightroom and they don't have the proper settings when it comes to working with Photoshop to do this flash ambient blending. Something changed throughout different updates through Lightroom and one of the most common things you'll see that gets screwed up is in the transfer preferences. So go to edit, go to preferences, and then look under the external editing tab. It'll first come up to general, but make sure you're in external editing. At the very top where it says edit in Photoshop 2020 or whatever you're using, this is a little bit of an older version of Photoshop, where it talks about you want the file format to be TIFF, color space, sRGB, 16 bit, 300 for the resolution, but most importantly is this guy here. You want it as none by default, uh, Lightroom and Adobe, they've set this to zip in so many releases and it just bogs things down when you're trying to go back and forth between Photoshop and Lightroom. So anyways, that will, should help speed things up. Make sure that compression is set to none. A couple more things real quick is that I can't stress this enough and that's to practice, 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 practice and practice at home. If you're having difficulty with something that you've noticed on site, you need to then exercise that particular skill. You need to refine that a little bit more. So at home, don't worry about cleaning your house and have to make it uh, shoot perfect because you're just going to probably throw the footage away, but it's an opportunity to test out your lights, try a technique, see what went wrong, try something again but you do it at home over and over and over again. And then when you're out in the field, then you can refine that and you'll see that you will improve. The second thing, last thing here is that if you are stuck, I do provide the private remote photography coaching. I do it via Zoom and I do these um, during the week. I also do some on the weekends, especially for people that are uh, out of the country uh, for Europe and whatnot. So if you are stuck, it does cost you by the hour. You can reach out to me for more information on availability and price and just email me at Nathan at NathanCoolPhoto.com. Please don't message me on YouTube. I don't check that often enough. But if you do send it to my inbox, Nathan at NathanCoolPhoto.com, then I'll be able to get that and respond to you with availability and pricing. Anyways, I hope this tutorial was useful for you and that you can use some of these tips in your photography as well. If you did like this video and you want to see more, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.